Here we're gonna look at the notion of something called a Cauchy sequence and prove some standard results involving Cauchy sequences. So let's look at the definition. So a sequence of real numbers a n is called a Cauchy sequence if for every epsilon bigger than zero there is a natural number capital N such that if little m and little n are bigger than or equal to capital N then a sub m minus a sub n is less than epsilon and that subtraction is within absolute values. So we want to look at this separately from a convergent sequence by seeing that here we're guaranteed that all of the elements of the sequence get close to each other after a certain point and perhaps not close to a given limit after a certain point. So that's exactly what this is saying. We can pick a very, very small epsilon, and then from that very, very small epsilon, we can find a natural number where, after that natural number, the terms of the sequence are very, very close together. Okay, so I wanna do a couple of examples first showing sequences are Cauchy. So here we'll let uh, a n be the sequence n over n plus one. We're gonna show that this is Cauchy. And we're gonna do this with our standard method where we work with the inequality until we get some sort of idea for what this capital N should be. So in other words, we're starting with this scratch work. So just to point this out, what we want is a sub n minus a sub n to be less than some epsilon, which we're given later. All right. So plugging in the value of the sequence, that gives us n over n plus one minus m over m plus one. But now notice we can like combine those fractions together by finding a common denominator. And that is gonna give us n times m plus one minus m times n plus one over this product m plus one times n plus one and all of that's within absolute values. But now notice, if we distribute things out in the numerator, some stuff cancels. We have m times n here, we have m times n here, so those are gonna cancel, and that's gonna leave us with the absolute value of n minus m over this m plus one times n plus one. So now here we wanna start working with inequalities instead of equalities, and we also want to use the fact that among m and n, one of them has to be bigger than or equal to the other. So I'll go ahead and point that out here. Without loss of generality, we may assume that m is less than or equal to n. Okay, good. So now what we want to notice is that if m is less than or equal to n, we know this absolute value of n minus m is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of n. So that's going to build this following inequality. So we've got this is less than or equal to the absolute value of n over m plus 1 times n plus 1. Now we would like to cancel this out a little bit so we have something a little bit simpler and we can easily do that by noticing that n over n plus one is less than one and so that means we can cancel those if we continue the inequality. So this is less than one over m plus one and I might as well point out that this is because n over n plus one is less than one and it's bigger than zero also. And so notice we've got this one over m plus one, and we can most definitely pick some value of capital N so that that is less than epsilon. Now that we've got this kind of sketched out, we can rewrite our example and a proof of our example in the correct order. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's our proof that a sub n is Cauchy. So let's say that we're given epsilon bigger than zero, let's take a capital N such that one over capital N plus one is less than epsilon. So by the Archimedean principle, we know that we're able to do that. We've done stuff like that over and over again. And now notice that if n is less than or equal to capital M, which is less than or equal to, sorry, little m, which is less than or equal to little n, we have the absolute value of one over m plus one 
is less than epsilon. And that's because one over M plus one is less than one over N plus one, capital N plus one. Good, but then from uh, these calculations, which you would really wanna repeat again here, kind of in reverse, we have the absolute value of A sub N minus the absolute value of A sub M, but that's gonna be equal to the absolute value of N plus one minus the absolute value of m plus one, but that's gonna be less than or equal to, by, like I said, the calculations over there, the absolute value of m, sorry, of one over m plus one, but that's gonna be less than or equal to the absolute value of one over capital N plus one, but that's strictly less than epsilon, which is exactly what we needed to show if we look at the extreme left and right hand side of that inequality. Okay, so now that we've done this example, I'll go ahead and clean up the board and we'll prove a nice result related to Cauchy sequences. Now we want to prove the classic result that in the real numbers, a convergent sequence is equivalent to a Cauchy sequence. So in other words, if we've got a sequence of real numbers, this sequence converges if and only if it is Cauchy. So this is not true if we're outside of the real numbers, like if we're in some other system. So maybe post in the comments if you know some sort of setup where this kind of uh, equivalence is not true. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the proof of this. We'll look at this forward direction first. So in other words, we will suppose that A n converges and show that it is Cauchy. So let's go ahead and suppose, like I said, that A n converges and we'll say that it converges to L. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of A sub n is L. And we are given some epsilon bigger than zero and that epsilon is arbitrary as usual. So now using the fact that A n converges, what we wanna do is find our uh, natural number capital N such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, we have the absolute value of A sub n minus L is less than epsilon over two. So we know we have a convergent sequence, which means we can make the elements from our sequence as close as we want to the limit. So how close do we want here? We want it to be epsilon over two, where that epsilon is this arbitrary number that we were given before. Now we wanna to work towards showing this as Cauchy. So let's go ahead and suppose that M and N are bigger than or equal to N because that's we need to suppose that we have two of these things built into the definition of a Cauchy sequence. And now we just have a calculation to do. So I'll do that by saying note the absolute value of a n minus a m. That's going to be equal to the absolute value of a n minus l plus l minus a m. Great. So that's pretty easy to see. We just added and subtracted L. Now what we wanna do is use the triangle inequality to split this into two pieces. And so this is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of AN minus L plus the absolute value of AM minus L. So like I said, that's the triangle inequality. And notice I reversed this just using the fact that it's in an absolute value. But since M and N are bigger than or equal to this special capital N, we know each of these is less than epsilon over two. So we can say this is less than epsilon over two, and this next one is also less than epsilon over two. But that clearly adds up to epsilon. And now looking at the extreme left and right hand side of this inequality that we've built, we see that we have built the definition for a Cauchy sequence. So in other words, we have ended the proof that a n is Cauchy, starting from the fact that it is convergent. Okay, I'll go ahead and clean this up and then we'll look at the reverse direction. So now moving towards the reverse direction, we want to suppose that A sub N is a Cauchy sequence and show that it is convergent. And this actually requires two steps. 
And the first step is this claim that says that a n is in fact a bounded sequence. And then we'll use the fact that it's bounded to show that it converges in the next step. So here's what we want to do. So we'll take n1, and so that's going to be some natural number such that a sub m minus a sub n is less than 1, and this is going to be for all m and n, which are bigger than or equal to this n1. Okay, so let's talk our way through that. So we assumed that it was Cauchy, which means we can make the terms from the sequence as close as we want. And how close do we want them to be in this case? We want them to be just within one of each other. And so we're taking this n1 to be that special natural number so that after that point, every term from our sequence is within one from all the other terms from the sequence. So that's exactly that, what we've done here. Okay, great. And now the next thing that I want to do is notice that this is true for all m and n, which are bigger than or equal to n1. But what that means is that it is true for all m equal to n1 and n bigger than or equal to n1. So in other words, we can fix one of those indices. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll just write that down. So we're going to fix m equal to n1, and notice that that tells us that a sub n1 minus a sub n is less than or equal to 1, and this is true for all n, which are bigger than or equal to n1. Now we want to rewrite this absolute value inequality a little bit in two little steps. So the first thing that I want to do is, since that's within an absolute value, I can change the order here. So I'm going to make this a sub n minus a sub capital N1. That'll just make the calculation a little bit cleaner. Then next, what we want to do is remove the absolute values and make this a compound inequality. So that compound inequality will be minus one is less than a sub little n minus a sub capital N1, which is less than plus one. So this compound inequality is equivalent to this absolute value inequality. Now we'll isolate a sub little n in the middle, and that gives us um, a sub n one minus one is less than a sub n, which is less than a sub n one plus one. Good. But now we can like take the absolute value of each side and then apply the triangle inequality and that leads us to the following result. So we have the absolute value of a n is less than the absolute value of a sub n minus one plus one. And recall that that is true for all n bigger than or equal to n one. And now we're almost done. So what we see is that all n bigger than or equal to n1 are bounded. Every term from the sequence after n1 is bounded. And it's bounded by this absolute value of a sub n1 plus 1. But we're lucky because there are only finitely many terms before we hit n1. And those finitely many terms must also be bounded because it's a finite list of real numbers. So putting all of that together, we can see that the absolute value of a n is going to be less than or equal to the maximum of the absolute value of a1, the absolute value of a2, dot, 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 the absolute value of a sub n1 minus 1, and then comma, the absolute value of a sub n1 plus 1. Okay, so let's talk our way through that. So if little n is bigger than or equal to n1, we know that a sub little n is smaller than absolute value of a sub n1 plus 1. But now if n1 is less than or equal to capital N1, well then definitely a sub n is less than the maximum of, of all of those terms. So what we've ended up here with is that a n is bounded, which like I said, was the first part of the reverse direction of this proof.
Okay, so I'll go ahead and clean this up and we'll get to the end. Now we're ready to finish off the reverse direction of this proof. So far we've proved that if we have a Cauchy sequence, it is necessarily bounded. But let's also recall in the last video, we, we proved that every bounded sequence necessarily has a convergent subsequence. So that's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem. So let's go ahead and take that convergent subsequence. So like I just said, let's find a convergent subsequence, which we'll call A sub n k. That's k going from one to infinity. And like I said, that's a subsequence of A sub n, which is the sequence that we are trying to show is convergent. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and write down here that here we have the limit as k goes to infinity of A sub n k equals L. So this is a convergent subsequence, its limit is L. Now the next thing that we wanna do is let's say that we're given an epsilon bigger than zero. We somehow wanna force elements from our sequence, not the subsequence, to be within epsilon of L. So let's see how we can do that. So let's go ahead and take a capital K and a capital N2. Those are both natural numbers satisfying the following inequalities. So the first inequality is a sub n k minus l is less than epsilon over two, and this is gonna be true for all little k bigger than or equal to capital K. And let's go ahead and point out why that is possible, and that's because a sub n k converges to l. Good, and then the next thing that we wanna do is suppose that we've chosen this capital N2 such that A sub M minus A sub N is less than epsilon over two. And that's of course an absolute value as well. And this is gonna be for all M and N which are bigger than or equal to this capital N2. And let's go ahead and point that out um, that that is because A sub N is Cauchy. And since it's Cauchy, we can put the elements from the sequence as close together as we want. Here we want them to be epsilon over two together. Now we wanna suppose that um, little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, which we are setting equal to the maximum of these two. So K and N two, great. But now since N sub k is an increasing sequence of natural numbers, that means it's unbounded. So what we wanna do is find one of those elements which is bigger than or equal to n. Great, now again, we're gonna apply the triangle inequality like we just did, um, and we'll have a sub n minus l. Recall, that's the thing that we want to be less than epsilon. And we'll do that by adding zero and we'll add zero by adding and subtracting a sub n k. So this is equal to the absolute value of a sub n minus a sub n k plus a sub n k minus l. So like I said, we just added and subtracted a sub n k. Now applying the triangle inequality, we see that that is less than or equal to the absolute value of a sub n minus a sub n k plus the absolute value of a sub n k minus l. And then next we see that this bit is smaller than epsilon over two by this assumption that nk is bigger than or equal to n. And then this bit is smaller than epsilon over two because that is the convergence of our subsequence. So each of these parts is less than epsilon over two, but epsilon over two plus epsilon over two is epsilon. So again, looking at the extreme left, and right hand side of this inequality, we see that we have satisfied the condition that A n converges, completing the proof of this reverse direction. And that's a good place to stop.